Alright, well, we got ourselves here another DBE project. This time it's the Angry Orange. This is uh, my take on the Boss DS1. Uh, did some improvements to it, got rid of some of the tone sucking areas, did some of the uh, mods that uh, Keeley did to it, but then went a little bit further with some of the things. But anyways, we're going to go over how this pedal works, but first let's get a feel for what it sounds like. So first my clean tone. And now let's uh, get a sample of what this sounds like with everything turned up to, well, let's turn the level up just because the volume is going to be a little bit cranky, but let's uh, give a listen to the distortion at noon and the tone at noon. full blast distortion but with the tone kept in the center. Alright, now let's hear it with the tone cranked all the way over to its uh, darkest setting where it's really muffly. Kind of gives it a good stoner metal kind of a feel. Lastly, let's go for the tone going all the way in the other direction. This kind of gives it a bit of a really shrilly, bright, bright sound. But uh, if you're doing something like uh, maybe black metal, this kind of has a, a feel for it that works. Okay, let's get a quick analysis here of the topology before we jump into the actual schematic. So what we're going to be looking at is first the power supply, where the 9 volt power is cleaned up a little bit, and we provide bias to the transistors and the op amps in the circuit. After that we go to the input buffer, which is simply there to provide an input impedance for the circuit. From there we go to the transistor booster. This is there to give the signal a little bit of a punch. Uh, or a kick right before it gets into the op amp gain stage which in here we're going to have not just a little bit of clipping due to the op amp getting thrown to the rails but we're also going to have some hard clipping diodes right after that to further shape the signal and distort it. After that we go to the tone stack which actually looks a lot like the Big Muff Pi tone stack but instead of going to full blown ground we're gonna go to virtual ground or bias and then after we leave that we go to the output buffer this is just simply to recover the stage, take away some of the volume loss that the tone stack and the hard clipping before it has taken away. And then that sends it out to the guitar amp. And there we go. Now let's take a look at the schematic. All right, so the first thing we have is the power supply. Let's start out with the reverse polarity diode, traditional 1N4001. Nothing fancy there. After that, we have a large bulk electrolytic capacitor of 100 microfarad. This is just to keep the current and voltage stable coming in from the power supply. After that we have a simple voltage divider of two 10K resistors 
and that will create a 4.5 volt bias voltage that we'll use for biasing the transistors and the op amp later in the circuit. We also have ourselves a 47 microfarad decoupler capacitor decoupling the bias voltage to make sure that, the, that that's kept stable and ripple free as much as we can. Now from there we'll move into the input buffer circuit and see what's uh, being fed by this. Alright, so now we have the input buffer. So starting with the input signal that we have coming in, we go straight to an anti-pop resistor with a value of 2.2 mega ohm. And from there we have R1 and C1, which is creating a high pass filter. This is basically going to kill out all the very, very low frequencies, battery ripple, stuff like that. Uh, if you look at the build doc, you'll see that the filter right here is filtering out at around 7.2 hertz. Obviously, that's only going to be dealing with like low frequency parasitic oscillation. Nothing that's going to really affect your guitar signal, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, you have a 470k resistor here pulling up to bias, biasing the uh, 2N5088 transistor. And then we have a uh, emitter follower uh, 10k emitter resistor right here. Now let's uh, take a look at more specifically that input impedance. The reason that I don't believe that uh, Boss decided to include an anti-pop resistor on say the Boss DS1 is because this value right here actually can play a little bit of a havoc to the input impedance of your circuit because now instead of just dealing with R2 uh, and the beta of your transistor here now you have to include the parallel of this uh, anti-pop resistor so it's going to drop your input impedance eh, a smidge that's why this is also a very high value resistance to make up for that fact so assuming the beta of this transistor is 200, which is roughly what a 2N5088 is, uh, take a look at the data sheet if you're trying to get more specific. Uh, you're going to be looking at the parallel of R1 plus the parallel of the sum parallel of R27, R2, and the beta of this times R3. So that's... 1K, 2.2 mega ohm, you got that 470K, and then you got the 200 of the beta here times the 10K here, which brings that up to uh, 2 million. But uh, yeah, you do the parallel resistance to all these things right here, and you come up to a value of 325,443 ohms of input impedance. Uh, so 325K, that's not bad but you want to get it closer to one mega ohm if possible so if you were to say increase R2 to 2.2 mega ohm that right there would probably bring everything up to around 700k of input impedance which is well a lot better uh, basically what input impedance is uh, affecting is if this pedal is at the beginning of your chain and you have a long long cable going from your guitar straight over to it that's going to cause a, a darkness in tone uh, the longer the length of your guitar cable. So having a high input impedance fixes that from being a problem and ultimately is something that a lot of people try to get with their pedals. Now there are some pedals out there, especially the really, really old ones like the Rangemaster uh, or the Arbiter Fuzzface, which had an abysmal input impedance, but it also kind of gave it that charm to its tone. So sometimes having a low input impedance is not a bad thing. Just to take a look at it. So let's move on to the next part of the circuit here. So this is the transistor booster stage, or as I like to call it, pre-bake. Uh, the reason I call it that is because this is where the signal gets set up before it goes into the op-amp stage, or as I like to call it, this is where you pre-bake and heat your oven to get your signal nice and warm and fluffy on the other side where the op-amp is located. So what do we got going on right here is kind of simple, at least at first. We have a capacitor and these bias resistors which are in parallel I understand uh, if you were to take the parallel of these that comes out to about 91k and yes I realize I could have just had a single resistor pulling the bias at 91k and it would have worked I did it this way it works and I'm keeping it <laughs> but anyways you have that high pass filter between C2 and the parallel here of R4 and R5 that creates a high pass filter with a cutoff frequency of about 3.7 Hertz then we have another high-pass filter going between C3 and R6. 
And if you take a look at the build dock, you'll see there as well that we got a high cut or a high pass filter uh, with a cut frequency of 33.9 hertz. So we got one that's 3.7 hertz, and then we got one that's 33.9 hertz. Very low frequencies. The basic idea behind this is to get rid of the excess bass before we go into the amplification here and in the actual op amp section because if you put bass harmonics into a distortion it makes things very dumpy and very muddy and just not very clean sounding which is not what we want. After that we get to this section right here which is the common emitter amplifier. The common emitter amplifier is something you've probably seen before if you're familiar with the Big Muff Pi. This is kind of where the Big Muff Pi gets its sound from. And the math behind this is, well, it starts out kind of simple because you go, oh, it's a common emitter amplifier. That's real simple. That's just, you know, collector resistance divided by emitter resistance. And that's it. So, yeah, it's R8 divided by R9. That'll give you a value of 454, which if you translate that to dB, that's a 53 dB gain. That's pretty loud, pretty hefty. However, where it gets a little bit more complicated is you have feedback in here. So you have a feedback resistor and a feedback capacitor. That's going to actually drop the gain down quite a bit. That's going to bring it down to about 35 dB. Now even so, this is still going to be, you know, at, even at 56 times uh, with a 200 millivolt peak to peak guitar signal, that's still going to boost on this thing here around 11.2 volts peak to peak which will distort already right here with a 9 volt power supply. Uh, this gain will create a clipping that looks like a, a soft knee or soft clipping. So basically we got some soft clipping already starting before we actually get to the op amp where we're going to do the hard clipping. So let's actually take a look at that here in the next part of the circuit. Let's look at that op amp circuit. So here we have the op amp section where the actual distortion and heart and soul of this pedal comes in. As mentioning from the earlier analogy before, this is where the baking happens, as opposed to pre-bake. So what we have is we have a non-inverting op-amp section going into a hard clipping section and a bunch of RC filters to make sure that the clipping that happens is not taking in any of the harsh highs or the very muddy lows of your guitar signal. So it's starting here from left to right. We start with C5 and R10. This is a high-pass filter, but it's not intentional. It just happens to be there because, well, we have to couple from the previous section and we have to bias the op amp that's coming up. The RC filter here is basically a high pass for around 34 hertz, give or take. Uh, if you want to look at the math, take a look at the build dock, it should be right there. So that gets rid of some of the very, very low frequencies, stuff under 34 hertz. Then we go into a current limiting resistor as well as a reverse polarity diode to make sure that swings coming in on the input of this op amp right here doesn't cause any latch issues or really bad case scenario if the boosting transistor goes into full saturation the input on three can sink down below the rails and that can actually cause the magic smoke to come out of your op amp not desirable so this stops it doesn't create an asymmetrical clipping I know it kinda of looks like that but that's not what it's there for now from here we have just a buffering part of an op amp going into the next part of the op amp here and this is where the actual magic is happening. Now on older dual op amps like the Mitsubishi's that were used in the old Boss pedals, the uh, Mitsubishi 5223's, they did not handle the high end frequencies on outputs very well. So this pull up resistor here for R12 was even in the data sheets for most of these Mitsubishi chips this was a way to get those highs to smooth out. I noticed that on newer op amps, though not required, it actually gives it some interesting tonal qualities that I kind of find desirable. So I kept it in here, and that's why I got what you got here. So now we have the actual distortion knob here. Let's take a look at how the gain is calculated. So voltage gain is going to be the distortion pot, which is 100K, divided by R13 plus 1, whatever uh, the quotient of the divisors were uh, that you add one to that. So in this case you have 100k divided by 4.7k whatever that is you add one and that gets you 22.3 volts gain and that calculates out to being about 26.5 dB. Again this math is in the build doc so check it out 
in yeah just check it out and then after that we have a little bit of tone shaping here with some with some RC filters so first off we have our six right here in the feedback loop of the op amp this will get rid of some of the harsh harmonics on the high end before we get to the clipping stage and then we also have uh, the C7 R13 high pass filter here which much like this one back here does a lot of uh, f filtering at around 34 Hertz depending on where the vault or the, volume, the distortion knob is at again getting rid of some of those muddy lows that you don't want now another section that we have here is R14 and C9 this creates a low pass filter going through all these clipping diodes and that low pass filter by doing that is adding uh, uh, I think the, yeah, looking at the math, it's uh, around 7.2 kilohertz in my build dock. I did the math already. And, yeah, so that's to get rid of the shrilly highs and get rid of all those harmonics so that you don't have to deal with the gritty shininess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, bright, grainy, fizzy distortion. That's how you get rid of that kind of stuff. And then in there we also have another small filtering clipping capacitor here, the uh, C16, which as well does that. And that basically makes up uh, the entire section here. So basically we have stuff coming in, some circuit protection, amplification to the rails as much as we can, with some more clipping of highs and lows to get rid of all the fizz on top and the dirt on the bottom. And then we go into some hard slamming diodes. And then we go off into the tone control section. Now one other note here with the diodes, you can actually shunt the D6 and D5 right here so that you're only clipping with one silicon set of diodes. You can experiment with this. You can do asymmetrical clipping where you only shunt D5, but you keep in D6, D3, and D2. That kind of gives it a less compressed, wide open tube sounding distortion as opposed to a very compressed parallel, uh, symmetrical I should say, not parallel, uh, set of clipping. Just things to take into consideration. But all right, let's take a look at the tone that comes right after this. Okay, so now we have the tone stack section. If you've seen this before, it's probably because you've been looking at a Big Muff Pie. <laughs> uh, this is a classic Big Muff Pie style tone stack. Uh, the only difference that you might notice in here, aside from maybe some value differences, is instead of going to ground, we go to virtual ground, 4.5 volts, the bias. This still sounds very, very close to going to straight to ground. It's more of a board layout thing than a uh, actual sound thing so I could very well have dropped these to ground and still got the same or very similar sounds. The differences that you may witness when you try using bias as opposed to true ground is because your bias traces on your board are going to be traces usually and not planes. Uh, there can be some noise that does make it into the bias line. Just really oddball, really odd harmonics and those might actually give you kind of the flavor that makes your pedal sound, you know, the mojo you're looking for. So anyways, enough about that. Let's see what's going on here. It's, like I said, a traditional Big Muff Pie style tone control. We have a, a uh, low pass filter between R16 and C11, which has a frequency cut around 234 hertz. And then we also have a high pass filter between C10 and R17 right here that creates a frequency cut of around a little over a kilohertz. And then it has this tone knob right here that mixes between the two, which gives it a, if you kind of look at it like a seesaw, the uh, midpoint where the cuts and boosts intersect, it's kind of an average between the uh, 1 kilohertz and the 234 hertz. So somewhere around in the 500 hertz is the middle position where a flat tone knob response keeps everything. So that's kind of hard to explain unless you've really seen how the frequency responses of a Big Muff Pi scoop in the middle and then bulge up towards the treble and then can flip-flop and then they kind of have that mixing point in the middle. But anyways, yeah, that's that's basically the how this works is 500 hertz in the middle is where the thing seesaw so it can brighten up the one kilohertz range or it can really darken the uh, 234 hertz range 
which for distortion pedal, that's pretty ideal. So let's uh, move on from, oh, and then obviously we have the uh, volume level right after all the tone control, directly tied to it, by the way, which can actually affect it because it becomes a resistor going to virtual ground, and so therefore we get a little bit of a RC filter effect going on there. So the tone actually will change with volume level. Not much, but a little bit. And then after that, let's uh, move out to the output buffer. Okay, so now we have the output buffer, and this is the last piece of it. The output buffer here looks a lot like the very beginning input buffer. It's simply a task of keeping input impedance and output impedances uh, to be cor corrected for in the signal chain. Uh, in this case, being the output buffer, the output impedance, trying to keep it good so that the signal leaving the pedal is leaving it properly. So what we have here is just a plain emitter follower uh, with a 100K emitter resistor on R21, biased at 4.5 volts with a parallel chain here of R19 and R20, which basically one meg parallel with one meg is 500K. Uh, and then on here we also have the uh, input capacitor of C12 with R20. This creates a small high pass, uh, high pass filter. Bleh with a frequency cut of around 3.4 hertz. This is just basically to get rid of uh, DC level noise so that the biasing of this transistor is done proper. And then we just use a cheap high gain transistor like 2N5088. Any cheap high gain capacitor here will do. It's not a serious role that it's trying to commit to. However, there is a little bit difference uh, of how this output buffer is set up than a traditional Boss DS1 and that's with R21 right here. Now normally you would use a 10K for the emitter follower buffer to keep a unity gain of the signal, but one of the things that was a big complaint with the Boss DS1 is the volume suck. You had to basically crank the volume all the way up to max on the pedal just to get it to be unity with whatever the signal clean was coming in behind it, uh, with certain pickups that is. And this removes that issue, so bumping it up to a 100K resistor gives it a lot more oomph at the very end. Yes, it tone pal or tone paints, I should say, a little bit, but not by much. And then at the very end of this as well, we also have C13 and R23, which creates, uh, again, another high-pass filter, frequency cut of around 1.6 uh, hertz. So it's, again, below the audio spectrum. It's just to filter out any more DC-level noise. It might be trying to make its way out the circuit which could ruin your signal chain if it was allowed to pass. So that's basically it. From there, it distort or has your distorted sound rocking and rolling, going out to your amp. But anyways, uh, here's another video just explaining another sample topology of a circuit uh, for one of our pedals that we're going to sell here. So check that out. So I'd just like to conclude with here's basically what we have for the Angry Orange. Again, my take of a Boss DS1, but with some improvements, fixing up the tone in the areas that I think that I need fixed up on. There's some Keeley uh, mods that were done to the DS1 commonly back in the day that I also included in this, as well as some mods of my own. So if you like this and you like to see a little bit more circuit designs of upcoming pedals, uh, smash like. Uh, subscribe, and if you want to support us, just uh, check out our website, which is www.diyguitarpedals.com.au, and purchase a couple boards or a uh, couple kits. Uh, until then, uh, just leave some comments below and ask questions, and have yourself a good one, man. Cheers.